Thanks, so I was uh, one of the archaeologists who helped dig up the South Magnolia site um, that Hillary was describing. And I want to thank Wastewater for being great about this project. It's one thing to have to deal with cultural resources, but they actually care about cultural resources. So doing this outreach tonight is actually really exciting for us as archaeologists. So um, here we go. So during the course of monitoring for this storage tank that they were putting in, uh, the excavations encountered historic debris that we were able to associate with an early 20th century shanty town. Now because of the rarity and importance of this type of site, which I'll explain in a bit, we performed data recovery excavations to recover information about this often ignored demographic. And what we found in many ways differed from what was known of the time. So tonight I'm going to present two vignettes about the community, uh, one of which is their efforts at maintaining cultural continuity, and the second is a view of their daily life. So to orient you, we've got the site right there. Uh, West Point site is around here. This is what the site looks like today. They've got their storage tank building put in. Um, this is the soccer field. If you know, this is 23rd Avenue right here. You've got the water over on the side. This is what it looked like uh, when we encountered the historic site. They were excavating to put in this giant tank. Um, and they had already excavated out, excavated out all of this stuff when we found historic debris over here. So we went in to take a closer look at what it might be. This is a view looking down from the, the Magnolia Bridge. You're looking south. This is, you can see the water is right over there. There's 23rd Avenue. And there are our archaeologists diligently working away. So this is what it looked like um, early on. Now there are several uh, Native American ethnographic place names within Smith Cove. For this 1899 map, I want to point out to you this. This is our project area right in here. I want you to keep your eye on this sand spit, which is right here, which I'll point out quite a bit, as well as this yellow chimney, which are two kind of landmarks that we're going to use to orient ourselves through the historic photographs. So we know that Native Americans have lived here and utilized the Magnolia area for millennia prior to, prior to Seattle's founding in 1851. We also know that place names have been recorded along the shoreline of the Sound in either direction of Smith Cove and north of Salmon Bay. When Dr. Henry Smith arrived at the Cove in 1850, several indigenous families were still living here. Early non-Native settlers remembered Native people camping on the Smith Cove sand spit into the early 20th century and occupying the area temporarily while collecting shellfish, fishing, and smoking fish for winter stores. Here we go. The first news we have from Smith Cove were local newspaper accounts discussing Native peoples at Salmon Bay and Smith Cove in association with the smallpox outbreak. As the years went on, competing in private interests and influential railroad companies vied for ownership of the Seattle Tidelands through the late, the late 19th century. Prior to, to the formation of Washington State in 1889, federal legislation required vital harbor areas to be held in trust until a state government was formed. But by 1889, much of the harbor lands were already occupied by private interests. This is true not only for Smith Cove, but also along the Seattle waterfront and down in the Stadium District in Soto as we know it today. Years of drawing and redrawing Tideland plats continued through until 1895 when the lines allowed for more public ownership amongst entrenched private interests and the railroads. You can see the 1890, or 1895 platting, our project area right there, and they platted out this whole Tideland area right through here. Being located within Seattle's Tidelands, ownership of the Smith Cove sand spit was disputed. And when the Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern Railway Company attempted to acquire the land through government appropriation in 1893, Existing occupants filed lawsuits and stated their attempts at claiming the land were denied in favor of the railroad interests. Reports note the presence of squatters on the sand spit, including Lewis Rice, who occupied the area since at least 1881, as well as Jacob Davidson, who raised thoroughbred chickens on the land, and George McMillan, who was described as the last of the squatters on the Smith's Cove sand spit to hold his ground. Now, despite these supposed evictions, squatters continued to occupy the sand spit into the 20th century, according to the obituary of Thomas Kelly, who was known as the mayor of Smith's Cove sand spit. Following the railroad's ownership victory, piers were built for coal bunkers and track laid through Smith Cove. The Panic of 1893 brought increasing unemployment across the nation, and particularly in Washington, where many had flocked in pursuit of mining, logging, or other industrial jobs that were no longer available. 
It's possible that some of these squatters have been displaced by this economic downturn. And according to the 1900 federal census, Kelly was listed as living in an unnumbered house among the house, shacks, tents, barges on the waterfront near the railroad track. Kelly was a divorced Irish immigrant who earned a living burning charcoal. And many of his neighbors were also Caucasian and either divorced, single, or widowed with similar working class jobs. In 1896, the Great Northern entered into a contract with Japan's Nippon Yusin Kaisha shipping line using Smith Cove as its terminus. So you can see, looking from uh, Queen Anne Hill over to the Magnolia Bluff, you've got that yellow chimney right there. The sand spit in our project area is going to be right in there. And is that now what is now called Pier 90 and Correct. Correct. Yeah, today it's Pier 90 and 91. It's where the cruise ships come in. Uh, in addition, the railway constructed ocean liners Minnesota and Dakota, shown here, to transport passengers and goods between Smith Cove and China, Japan, and the Philippines. Newspaper articles at this time report the regular arrival of these ships in Smith Cove. And with access to the east came some less savory aspects of travel. In the early 1890s, cases of human trafficking were reported in Smith Cove. One case in 1892 noted an operation that landed on the sand spit, unloading an estimated 60 Chinese people from British Columbia. A witness had described them hiding their luggage and dispersing into the hillside. They were reported to police by several small cabins on the spit the following morning. In 1913, six Chinese were arrested in Smith Cove, having come ashore the Great Northern's Minnesota. The vessel's engine room employee was also arrested and found with several tins of opium. In 1917, a Japanese person was reportedly smuggled into Smith Cove via the Shingo Maru steamer. The ability of Chinese to live in Seattle was difficult even from a legal perspective. Chinese immigration into the Seattle area was strictly regulated by a network of federal, state, and municipal laws. At the federal level, the main law influencing the experiences of the Chinese during the late 18th and early 20th century, or late 19th and early 20th century, was the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. This prohibited the immigration of Chinese laborers as well as their wives and children for a 10-year period, with exceptions for, for professionals and merchants. The act was renewed every 10 years until made indefinite in 1902 and it was finally repealed in 1943 after World War II. Many Chinese had immigrated to the US and Washington in particular during the 1870s to work as laborers for railroad companies, coal mines, hop farms, lumber mills, and fishing industries. Chinese labor was especially important in digging the Montlake Cut here in Seattle. By 1876, there were 250 Chinese in Seattle and an additional 300 transient laborers in the greater Puget Sound region. Seattle, Seattle's Chinese populations were, not surprisingly, concentrated in today's international district. With the 1880s economic downturn, jobs were limited and anti-Chinese sentiments sparked a series of riots and violence across King County. Citizens of Seattle agreed that the Chinese should be removed, and on February 7th of 1886, anti-Chinese committee members forcibly removed approximately 300 Chinese laborers, sending them by boat to San Francisco. A week later, another 110 Chinese were sent away by steamer, with any remaining Chinese to be removed as soon as possible. In the 1920s, Washington State passed several restrictions on land ownership for Asian immigrants. And when the Immigration Act of 19 1924 was passed by Congress, immigration from Asia was completely excluded. But the Chinese weren't the only ones having trouble here. After the 1850s treaty era in the Puget Sound, Native Americans ceded lands to the US government and were primarily relocated to reservations. However, many resisted. When the Donation Land Claim Act of 1850 was passed by Congress, US citizens were able to file claims for lands ceded to the government through those treaties. In 1865, Seattle passed Ordinance No. 5, which restricted Native Americans from residing within the city. This ordinance was not reenacted in 1869, but exclusion efforts continued against Seattle's Native Americans through extra legal methods such as arson and discrimination. At the federal level, the ability for Native Americans to own land was tied to their citizenship status, and Native Americans were not considered citizens of the U.S. at this time. However, in 1875, the U.S. government attempted to encourage assimilation through extending the 1862 Homestead Act to apply to adult Native Americans who had or were willing to sever ties with their tribal relations. Native American land ownership continued to be controlled by the federal government until the Indian Homestead Act of 1884 and later the significant General Allotment Act of 1887, commonly known as the Dawes Act. The Dawes Act allowed those who accepted allotments a path to U.S. citizenship, 
However, the lands they were allotted were often leased to them by the federal government for a 25-year period, at the end of which citizenship may be granted upon the allottee. Native Americans were finally granted citizenship in 1924. But with that digression, let's get back to what was happening in Smith Cove during this period. So what you have as well as the railroads that were running through the Thailands, you had the Pioneer Glass Company incorporated in 1880, 1895. Its buildings were large wood frame structures with the distinctive yellow brick chimney seen here and as I showed you on those other maps and photographs. The operation was noted to have used sand from the sand spit to manufacture fruit jars, but the operation quickly went bankrupt and was sold at auction in 1901 and was shuttered in 1905. The chimney remained into the 30s and is a useful landmark in historic photographs and maps. So here's a look again, looking over at Magnolia Bluff. Uh, got the yellow chimney right in here, and here's that sand spit right there. You can see a few little shanties on the, on the banks here, as well as quite a bit of debris on the, on the spit right here. In 1911, the Port of Seattle organized and began exercising eminent domain to acquire waterfront land, property, property rights, by purchase or condemnation. And under this authority, the port condemned the Great Northern Piers at Smith Cove, and today only Piers 90 and 91 remain standing. Also in 1911 is the first iteration of the West Garfield Street Bridge, which was constructed as an east-west wooden trestle across the Smith Cove Tide Flats, connecting Queen Anne and Magnolia. The bridge generally followed today's Magnolia Bridge, apart from taking a turn south at 23rd Avenue West to cross over the sand spit and then jagging west at West Lee Street to skirt the southern shore of Magnolia Bluff. So you've got that shown right here. This is the same alignment as today's Magnolia Bridge. Cuts south down here and then moves over there. This is our site right here, our project area. Here's the sand spit and the yellow chimney right over there. Um, a major section of the trestle collapsed twice in 1920, destroying many homes and was never rebuilt. That part that was right here kept collapsing. And a garbage dump was also mapped off the north side of the street trestle, right over here. Uh, photographs and maps of, Smith, maps of Smith Cove after 1911 document continued presence of low quality shacks and houseboats scattered across the tide flats and sand spit despite condemnation by the port. Again, you can look over, see the yellow chimney right there, the trestle still standing at this time, and Garbage Hill right there. One image taking, looking, taken looking from a pier back toward the beach shows small shacks on the sand spit and possible canoes pulled up on the beach in front, suggesting that residents may have been native people. As you can see here. Despite the West Garfield Street Trestle opening the area for development in 1911, the west side of Smith Cove, which was our project area, remained considerably less commercialized than its eastern counterpart, where the factories and shipping terminals were concentrated. Unpermitted residential buildings and houseboats existed on the sand spit and along the West Garfield Street trestle, as is common within rights of ways and under bridges. With the glass factory shuttered, squatters appeared to have returned to occupy the sand spit and the surrounding tide flats. From approximately 1911 until 1942, when the U.S. Navy condemned the majority of Smith Cove for use during World War II, the project area was occupied by a second wave of squatters. This community was known by various names. In study records, it was referred to as Little Finland, Fintown, and Inner Bay Shacks. A Magnolia resident called it Jungle City in a letter complaining about its unsightly conditions, and in newspaper articles, it was known as Smith Cove Shacktown and Magnolia Beach. The community included houseboats and dwellings on the sand spit and lining the interior shores of Smith Cove along Magnolia Hill. So you can see we've got, this is 1930, so the start of the Magnolia Bridge right there under construction, 23rd Avenue West going down there. Here's our project area, as well as mapped uh, auto garages, grocery restaurant, and these are dwellings on this sand spit right here. While the unpermitted community was located on land owned by the Port of Seattle, it appears to have been allowed to exist largely undisturbed despite its high visibility from adjacent trussels and shipyards. Residents of this marginalized community were visited by federal census takers in the 1920, 30, and 40, and were included in city telephone directories. These dwellings with addresses were documented on fire insurance maps, although when comparing these entries to dwellings visible in photographs, it's clear that additional residences were present and not accounted for in the census data. These omissions appear to have primarily been houseboats. 
Detailed construction documentation of the houseboats, auto garages, and grocery store are not available, so photographs provide the best information for these structures. Uh, even the houses on the sand spit were excluded from assessments as they were within the platted Seattle Tidelands. Census records note some of the residents of these dwellings paid rent, and it's unclear to whom it was paid. So you see, looking over, this is still Tide Flats right here. There's the trestle, here's a footbridge. There's our project area right there. Auto garages, restaurant, houses, quite a bit of debris just kind of washing up on the shore in the tidal zone. One commercial was identified. This was the grocery restaurant established around 1916. The grocery was operated by a Norwegian immigrant, Alexander Anderson, from 1916 until his death in 1934 at 77 years old. Anderson previously operated the Liverpool Bar near Seattle's downtown waterfront. The grocery restaurant employed a German widower, Nicholas Elmers, as a salesman in 1920 and later as a cook. Elmers passed away in 1934 at age 67 due to complications from falling off the boardwalk. After Anderson's passing, also in 1934, the business was continued by Frank Ludstrom, a Finnish immigrant. And in 1940, several boarders were listed as living in the grocery, including a widow named Mabel Corbett and her daughter Wanda, John Lottie, who was Finnish, and Frank Thomas and his wife Viola. In general, records of the area from the 1920s through 40s depict a population comprised of families, divorcees, and single elderly residents. There is a map again, looking at the tide flats, a lot of debris washing up, houseboats, project area, auto garages. There's the grocery restaurant I'm talking about right there. Looking at household composition, the community had a majority of divorcees in 1920, which drops off dramatically, dramatically in the other census years. The number of families remained strong among recorded households. These include both immediate family, husbands, wives, and their children, making up a household, as well as other arrangements where different family members lived in the same household. I know there's a lot on this slide, but bear with me. Looking at the ethnic composition of the Smith Cove shantytown, ethnicities identified at this time include Norwegian, Finnish, and white Americans of unknown ethnicity. The Finnish population is fairly high in each of the census years, beaten only by unspecified American. There's also a good representation of Norwegian and Swedish residents supporting the Scandinavian population here. Interestingly, though perhaps not surprisingly, is the lack of representation of Asian people, Chinese and Japanese, as well as, well as Native Americans, which from the artifacts we recovered, we know live here. Two, to, two Native American residents were listed in the 1930 federal census as renters nearby, but slightly out of our project area. These were Alonzo Hamlet, age 70, occupied as a tugboat engineer, and William Sexton, age 30, occupied as a tugboat mate. Census records also list many residents held working class jobs, such as general laborers, stevedores, grocers, cooks, waitresses, and so forth. Skilled workers include, include milliners, blacksmith farriers, carpenters, spinners, and electrical repairmen. Those grouped in the labor category shown here include house painters, drivers, and window washers, to name only a few. The largest contingent are those residents involved in water work, such as fishing or working in the shipyards. The community was understandably water-focused and described in 1934 as an isolated colony with its residents concerned mostly with fishing and gathering firewood. Newspaper articles provide a personal glimpse into the life of this community. Several shootings had been reported here, including that of 51-year-old laborer, Bert One-Eyed Charlie, who was fatally shot in 1929 by a group of young boys visiting the community to scare the residents with a 22 caliber rifle. In 1926, a year-long quarrel between fisherman Fred Holstrom and longshoreman John Raddick culminated with Holstrom shooting Raddick just outside the Anderson grocery store. Although the community seemingly just wanted to be left alone, some of their neighbors felt differently. Public opinion regarding the community was strong. You have this one who was writing to the Seattle Councilman, who was saying, in all fairness to people like ourselves who invested in good homes in the Magnolia District, we feel that what is known as Jungle City should be removed. It has decreased the value of all property in this district. You also have neighbors imploring the city to do something about the unsightly community and others who understand the hardship being suffered by the Shacktown residents but still demand action. In particular, we recognize the fact that these people have drifted in from other parts of the country, that no funds are available for other housing, that our governor has vetoed the bill which might have enabled them a chance to help themselves, that it is unlawful to shoot or drown them, but we want you to do something about it. 
So whether in response to ongoing efforts to eliminate the shacks within the Seattle city limits or due to needs stemming from World War II, in 1941, the US Navy commissioned a real estate assessment of the land for construction of a supply depot and naval station. The parcels examined for the assessment did not include properties west of 23rd Avenue West, our project area. However, aerial photographs confirm the continued presence of dwellings here. And you can see the formal buildings still documented on a 1942 insurance map. You have a little more development over here. I didn't show the extent of it. There are more houses popping up on this sand spit. All the buildings in the Tidelands were removed by the US Navy. The raising was done by naval officers from Bremerton who demolished approximately 50 to 90 shacks in the Smith Cove area. While doing so, Anton Snyder was caught in the fire and died. Snyder, 79 years old, was asleep at the time the fire started and was, able to un was unable to escape his home. And so ends the shantytown in Smith Cove. So with that, we can get into what we found after the Navy came in and filled the area with 12 to 14 feet of material so they could prepare it for their supply depot. Again, looking down, here's our little site right here inside their store where they want the storage tank to be. Our work recovered 2,600 artifacts that represent 32 years of occupation ending in 1942. Items are typical of historic residential debris and include a variety of tablewares, bottles, construction materials, clothing, and health and personal hygiene items. Based on the photographs, dates, and types of artifacts and known history of the area, we can interpret this deposit of the, as the remains of a long-term opportunistic dump by a low-income multi-ethnic community. This is not the evidence of a single household. So again, the two vignettes I want to talk about are cultural continuity and daily life. As I've discussed, this was a rather poorly documented community, but we have the benefit of some photographs and census data to give us an idea of, of who lived here in the early 1900s. A handful of photographs posted online provide snapshots of Fintown from Florence Drummond, who grew up in the community. In a letter written by Florence, she makes note of the saunas in the community frequented by the local Finnish ba bachelors. In the 50s and 60s, the Seattle Times humorist made a, note, made a note of the boisterous speakeasies and bootleg joints that ran throughout the community. However, there are also children and families living here, as demonstrated in this photograph, including Wanda, whose birthday it is, who is the daughter of the grocery store owner. The diversity of households and residents is also demonstrated in the census data I showed earlier. However, there are those people who do not appear in the photographs or the formal record. In particular, we found evidence of cultural continuity and the maintenance of traditional lifeways, which at that time was actively discouraged. We have a handful of materials that are evidence in particular of Asian lifestyles. We have a shirt of a Chinese brownware jar, a popular decorative type and indicator of Chinese peoples, a Chinese coin, and a Japanese style teapot lid. The brownware, which is this one right over here, is a small straight-sided jar that would have been used by Chinese doctors to store medicinal ointment or herbs. The porcelain teapot lid, shown here, we also have it on display in the back. Unfortunately, the design could not be deciphered, um, but speaking with uh, some of my contacts, it could be possibly a broom or a fly whisk. Um, other people have said it might be a sahai, also known as a baton of command used by samurai leaders. Uh, unfortunately, no pattern could be found that matches the shape. We also have a King Long coin, which was minted between 1936 and 19, or I'm sorry, 1736 and 1795, right here, also on display in the back. Um, the, the coin dates to the Qing Dynasty, and since literally billions of this particular coin was minted, they were still used into the 20th century. In addition, we have several Japanese import alcohol bottles. There's one from the Dai Nippon Beer Company, which was manufactured by the Kabuto brand. The Dai Nippon Beer Company was an operation between 1906 and 1949, also manufacturing Sapporo and Tsingtao brands, among others. Now, the origin of the Japanese bottles is unknown. They may have come in with Asian immigrants, legal or otherwise, landing in Smith Cove. But whether they were dumped here by immigrants or were the result of rum running through the Prohibition era, which in Washington was 1916 to 1933, remains unknown. Canada had endured its own experiment with prohibition between 1901 and 1917 and played a key role in rum running in the Puget Sound. And we know that Smith Cove in particular, as well as many shorelines in the Puget Sound, were a landing site during prohibition. Additional support for there being Asian populations is from the faunal remains. 
Final analysis identified 15 artifacts with cut marks of an Asian meat cleaver. Within this site, these were found predominantly on pig bones. This is consistent with other Chinese sites excavated on the west coast where the residents preferred pork to other animal protein. The recovered bones often had machine cut saw marks as well, which means that these pieces were bought from a commercial butcher. Chinese butchers most often remove the bones before selling pork or beef. And as a result, we propose that the Chinese individuals within the site were buying their meat from a local butcher and processing them in the traditional manner at home. It is assumed that individuals at this site were obtaining at least some of their food sources locally and not traveling to Chinese shops in areas like the International District. We also have evidence of Native Americans practicing traditional skills. Perhaps one of the most interesting artifacts demonstrating this is the glass scraper. These are tools that could be quickly manufactured and were typically used for working hides. How it was used here is unknown, but it was surely a rapidly fabricated item, for, perhaps for single use. It's easy to substitute an informal tool for a formal tool in everyday life, and that may be what happened here. We have this in the back. It's pretty small. It's about the size of the tip of your thumb, and you would just use this to scrape material. You could, you could make one pretty easily just using the base of a bottle if you, if you flake it appropriately. The presence of Native Americans is also inferred through the presence of faunal remains related to traditional tool manufacturing, processing of wild fauna for possible religious and cultural practices, and intensive processing of wild-cut fauna for bone marrow and grease. And we have four bones that portray this. The most significant is a bone wedge made from the long bone of a mature large mammal, such as an elk or a cow. The tool follows the traditional form of a wedge used for tasks such as wood carving. However, it differs in that it's been manufactured using a sharp, heavy-bladed heavy metal knife, which you can see the cut right here. The, the fact that the individual who made this tool already had access to a metal cutting implement shows the cultural significance of using this particular cultural item. Additionally, the radius of a seabird was recovered with at least five thin perpendicular diagonal marks running down its surface. The radius is this part of your arm. It would be part of the wing bone. Um, this particular bone has very little meat utility, so it's likely that the wing was defleshed for its feathers and not its meat. In pre-contact Northwest Coast sites, the presence of seabird wing bones with evidence of processing has been associated with gathering feathers for religious purposes. And we propose that this practice was carried over into the 20th century in Smith Cove. Finally, two fragments of bone which were broken and then processed to extract their bone marrow and grease were also recovered. Um, unfortunately, no artifacts were recovered that were definitively Finnish, Scandinavian, German, or otherwise indicative of European lifeways. Rather, the collection represents a community that had access to almost any good imaginable through mail order catalogs and the railroads that crisscross the nation. This leads into the second aspect I'd like to talk about, which was the community in general. By the early 20th century, the American marketplace provided access to almost any good imaginable. But with that being said, the Chinese brownware ointment jar would have been slightly more difficult to obtain, perhaps requiring a trip to the international district since these types of items were not available through Sears Roebuck and Montgomery Ward catalogs. Likewise, the Japanese beer bottles, because of their dates of manufacture, would have been illegally obtained. But the transcontinental railroads that span the nation made the industrial production centers of New York and Chicago accessible to the West Coast. So the economics were more of a boundary than the availability was. If this assemblage is a reflection of multiple households, it appears that this community purchased and used what they could and what was common of the period. The first thing that shows this is looking at health and hygiene. Patent medicines were popular during the late 1800s and early 1900s as cure-alls. Bitters and cures were among these and contained high quantities of alcohol and opiates, respectively. It is presumed that bitters and tonics were first devised in the 1840s by the British as a way to avoid heavy taxes by adding various harsh tasting herbs to gin and calling the product bitters, then claiming that it held medicinal purposes. Now, by the time taxes were reduced, the product had gained such a foothold in Britain that grew to include America. And this was again boosted in the states where alcohol was taxed more heavily than medicines. So what you have in particular, these are two of the most popular bitters and cures, respectively, bitters and cures of the early 1900s. Hostetter stomach bitters, which renews vigor and makes life, life worth living, was 94 proof. And Mrs. Winlow's soothing cough, soothing syrup was actually morphine, which I guess would really help with teething children. So while there's no information to suggest that cures became a necessity in the US due to restrictions, they no doubt became popular due to their opiate content. 
The collection yielded a minimum of 31 medicine bottles, including four bitters and six cures. The bitters were identified by bottle shape and color, and unfortunately have no other diagnostic information, so unfortunately we don't know specifically which ones they were. The cures that we found include Bromo Seltzer and one bottle of a snake oil from the American Drug Syndicate, one bottle of Nile Quality Medicine, and a bottle of Listerine. Bromo Seltzer in particular was discontinued in 1975 after it was discovered that the active ingredient, acetanilidine, was poisonous and led to hallucinations, confusion, and coma. I don't know why it took them 80 years to figure that out, but it did. It was later reformulated in the 90s, and you can actually buy it today. We assume that it's safe. We also have Listerine, which was first invented as a disinfectant for surgical procedures in 1879. It was later sold as a floor cleaner and a cure for gonorrhea. In 1895, it was discovered to be effective at killing germs commonly found in the mouth, but it wasn't until 1920 that it took off after the as it was advertised as a solution for, quote, chronic halitosis, which was a term invented by the Lambert Company that made Listerine. And this made it a runaway success to find a problem and then market a solution. Other medicines include four bottles that would have been prepared by a pharmacist with doctor's prescription, not over-the-counter items. What this means is that some effort was expended among this population to visit a physician. This is perhaps best illustrated with a bottle of Prohibition-era medicinal liquor, which we have at the back, you can see. Uh, under the 18th Amendment, six companies were licensed to supply the 100-proof bonded spirits, and the American Medicinal Spirits Company was one of them. This is our artifact, this is what it looked like. This is what the bottle looked like, just an example. The market was small, selling to pharmacists who could provide medicinal spirits on the orders of a doctor, and each patient was allowed by prescription one pint of 100 proof spirits every 10 days. In particular, you could get a prescription to combat a lack of vitality. But people here also had the means and inclination to visit an optometrist, pharmacist, or take it upon themselves to do at-home remedies, as seen with the anal irrigator, which we have right down here. Enemas have been used for millennia, and even in the 1800s were recommended as therapy for both constipation and diarrhea, dysentery, cholera, worms, and perhaps my favorite, to calm hysterical women, where they specifically recommended using cold water. Even with the luxury of visiting healthcare practitioners, these households do not appear to have lived high on the hog. They bought some of the most common and affordable products available. So we've got also this pair of eyeglasses, so they went to the optometrist, and a bottle of uh, prescription medicine. The second part of the community is seen through the ceramics, and ordinary whiteware would be expected for this, for this uh, setting, and not surprisingly, it's what we found. The presence of a handful of high-quality earthenwares and porcelains may indicate either heirloom pieces or special decorative vessels to adorn the table. The patterns observed do not indicate purchasing in sets, as you can see advertised here. It's a whole lot of dishes. Uh, nor does it indicate a la carte purchasing of similar patterns to imitate a matching set. There are only a handful of decorated pieces, including the famous willow pattern, which you can actually still buy today. The Chinese were best in ceramic production for centuries and the envy of European manufacturers. The most prevalent example of this is the Chinese blue and white porcelain first developed in the 13th century. The patterns and paintings on these wares gave European and American consumers their first impressions of that culture. Once the Europeans discovered how to manufacture a competitive product in the 1700s, they immediately began imitating the designs of the blue and white Chinese products. Fascination with the East continued despite the opium wars and subsequent trade restrictions of the 1840s. And the result is a Chinese-inspired style used by European potters that is more fantasy than reality. The most famous of these, of course, is the willow pattern, first developed in the 1790s and has been imitated ever since. Now, which Chinese patterns this European creation was derived from remains unknown, but regardless, the Chinese potters began imitating the British willow pattern and exported it to Europe. This, in turn, helped spread the idea that the willow pattern was based on ancient Chinese design, which was eventually accompanied by a legend. So this is a really great case of marketing, where the Chinese made the original product, the British copied the product, the Chinese liked the British product, so they copied the British product, and then sold it back to the British. So the British came up with a legend to give credit to this being an ancient Chinese design, which it was not. 
And the legend goes like this. This is a picture of the entire design, not just the fragment we have. You've got a rich and powerful Mandarin living in a sumptuous mansion located right here. And he, and he worked for the emperor as a customs officer. He had a hardworking bookkeeper named Chang who did the work while the Mandarin took bribes. Chang fell in love with the Mandarin's daughter, Kung Si, who returned his love and met him among the orange trees over here. The Mandarin found out and built a fence right here to separate the lovers and built a separate apartment over here to seclude his daughter. He then betrothed her to a wealthy and elderly friend, Duke Tajin. However, the lovers arranged to meet and elope. They fled the house with a box of jewels across the bridge, pursued by the Mandarin. So you have the three figures on the bridge over here. Kung Si, carrying a distaff as a symbol of virginity, followed by Chang, carrying the box of jewels, and finally the Mandarin, carrying a whip. The lovers escaped by boat with the help of a fisherman to a distant island, shown right there, distant island over there, where they settled down happily. The duke sent soldiers to attack the island and killed Chang. Kung Si then set the house on fire and died in the flames. And the gods transformed the two lovers into immortal doves who remained united forever. So it seems like a really fancy piece of tableware, but it was actually very common. Lots of people had this particular design. So with these stories, what do we know about the site and the people who lived here? I think there's a pretty strong argument for cultural continuity in an environment where acculturation was heavily encouraged and in some instances demanded. As observed in the faunal remains, the residents of Smith Cove Shantytown purchased cuts of meat, market cuts of meat, but then butchered them to make their traditional foodways. And preservation of traditional lifeways is further evidenced in the use of a bone chisel and glass scraper. But the artifacts really reflect a time when just about anything could be made available. Over-the-counter medicines were available and used here, alongside prescriptions. The tablewares likewise reflect the status quo, wherein the most common ceramics were purchased and used. And in all, this archaeological site serves to enhance our knowledge of this little town and historically misrepresented community. Thank you.